Well, thank you, Quentin. Good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here back in Australia on a, on a lovely winter's day, which puts to shame the summer days that we're suffering in London at the moment. Um, swap this weather any time. Uh, it is indeed the 61st edition of our annual review of world energy. Um, and each year what we try and do is look back at the past year's data, so we're looking at 2011, and try and tease out the main stories from that year. And what does it tell us about long-term trends and the way the, the markets operate? The main theme for this year is really all around the disruptions that we saw in 2011 and how the global energy system coped with those disruptions and what lessons, if any, we can, we can draw from the adjustment. The, the lasting memories of 2011 uh, are likely to be of human hope and tragedy, of courage and frailty in the face of natural disaster and political upheaval. Uh, the world of energy, which is the focus for this review, those, those events translated into large and unpredictable disruptions in supply and demand. Quantifying the disruptions is, the, is where we're going to start. Political unrest and violence caused uh, loss of oil supply and gas production in parts of the Arab world. The loss of Libyan oil exports alone was a 1.2 million barrels a day disruption. If you add in the outages of gas from Libya and oil supply from elsewhere in the Arab world, that was a total decline in excess of 72 million tonnes of oil equivalent, and that's roughly 11% of European Union oil consumption, for example. It's a large number. And of course, in uh, Japan, with the tragic events surrounding the earthquake and tsunami, we had the shutdown of Fukushima, followed soon after by eventually the shutdown of all the Japanese nuclear reactors. There was also coal damage to coal-fired power generation capacity in Japan, and German nuclear reactors were shut down in response. If you add all of that up together, that's the loss of 43 million tonnes of oil equivalent of energy. Roughly um, a third of Asia's nuclear output, or 7% of world nuclear output. So large shocks to the system. In addition, in 2011, we also saw, for the first time ever, an annual average oil price above $100 a barrel, the first release of strategic petroleum reserves since 2005, the largest increase in OPEC production since 2008, an exceptional swing in European weather, from a relatively cold year to a warm year, and here in Australia, of course, huge floods, which had a big impact on coal production. So it was anything but a boring year in 2011. And yet, when you look at the aggregate data, what was happening to total energy consumption in the world, nothing out of the ordinary appears. It appears to be a smooth year, everything on trend. Um, GDP and energy consumption both grew in 2011 at or about their 10-year average growth rate. GDP, 3.7%, slightly faster than primary energy consumption growth, 2.5%. That gives you an improvement in energy intensity, amount of energy per unit of GDP of 1.1%. That's all in line with long-run 10-year trends. And as we'll see, um, other trends are also in place. The evolution of fuel shares, for example, is broadly in line with long-term trends, with the obvious exception of nuclear power. The first place where we really see an indication that there was something else going on is in prices. We had large increases in prices across most fuels and most geographies. Oil prices, measured by dated Brent, up 40% to $111 per barrel. That's a record in nominal money of the day terms. If you want real inflation adjusted prices, you have to go all the way back to 1864 to find a higher price. And of course, in 1864, that's just a few people swapping a few barrels in a hotel in Pennsylvania. This doesn't really count. So very high prices for oil. Uh, for coal, if you add together the coal market prices that we published in the, the review, they increased by 24%, the biggest increase in Europe. Gas prices in the US down. So gas prices down in the US, but elsewhere outside the US, gas prices rose. Many of those gas prices, of course, are linked to oil prices, so they naturally went up with oil prices, and spot prices rose as well. So pretty much everything outside the US was increasing. Supply disruptions are one plausible explanation for what was going on. The other usual suspect is the economy. Something happening in economic growth. Well, when we look at the economic data, there's nothing much there to indicate an abnormal year in terms of pressure on energy demand and prices. Global economy grew by 3.7% in purchasing power parity terms, 2.7% uh, if you use market exchange rates. Lower than 2010, but very much in line with long-run 10-year averages. Uh, as is now customary, non-OECDs and developing economies outpaced OECD growth. 
Uh, they contributed more than three quarters of the, uh, the growth in the global economy last year. But for both camps, OECD and non-OECD, pretty much on trend in terms of economic growth. There was, of course, volatility and disparities within each of those camps, but particularly in the OECD in 2011. Uh, for Japan, the pathway, of course, um, determined by the earthquake and tsunami. Growth in the US, uh, into tentative recovery mode. Europe, uh, the way we phrase it is it's still um, coping with unresolved issues in the unified currency area. So a difficult time still for Europe. Um, both those developments are still with us. The world is going through a, uh, an adjustment to a post-financial crisis world with slightly lower growth rates. We're starting to see repercussions of that even in places like China and India now. Um, but that's really an issue for 2012, wasn't an issue for 2011. When you add in prime energy growth, again, nothing out of the ordinary appears at the aggregate level. The big picture is no extraordinary impact from the economy on energy demand. Composition of fuels evolved broadly in line with long-term trends. Really, to start seeing a deviation from trend, you have to split out non-OECD and OECD. So the non-OECD countries, energy consumption growth at 5.3%, bang on line with the 10-year average growth rate. Um, China, of course, growing very rapidly, 8.8% increase in energy consumption there. That's equivalent to adding the entire annual consumption of energy of the UK, or if you prefer, one and a half Australians, just one year's growth in China. <coughs> Uh, every year we see China passing another milestone. In 2011, China overtook the US to become the world's largest power producer, biggest power generator in the world. So that's all as expected on trend for the non-OECD. OECD, in contrast, there was a decline in energy consumption of 0.8%, despite uh, average GDP growth. Uh, and this is now the third out of the last four years where we've seen a decline in energy consumption in the OECD. What happened in 2011? Broadly, there are three reasons why energy consumption declined. Uh, first of all, uh, the price increase, high prices, uh, particularly high oil prices. For the, non for the OECD, there's relatively little subsidization of fuel prices, so an increase in international prices feeds directly through to consumer prices and consumers respond. And we've certainly seen that in the OECD. In the US, for example, uh, energy consumption down 0.4% in 2011 driven by oil, and oil is where we've seen the largest increase in, in, in prices. Second reason for the decline, uh, Fukushima. So Japan, the world's third, la third largest economy, energy consumption there declined by 5% in 2011. has a noticeable in impact. Finally, third reason, Europe experienced a significant shift in the weather from a cold year to a warm year, almost a record switch in heating degree days. And that was the key reason behind a 3.1% decline in European energy consumption. Uh, these energy dislocations in the OECD give us another indication of how the markets coped with the disruptions. And just to summarise, in a nutshell, three major adjustments took place. Uh, first of all, an increase in oil supplies to offset the Libyan outage, most notably from Saudi Arabia, together with flexibility in trading and in refining, allowed heavier Saudi crudes to replace the lost Libyan barrels. Secondly, there was a diversion of natural gas which had been heading to Europe towards Asia to meet the increased demand for gas, particularly in Japan. Uh, and finally, there was a, if you like, a release of coal from the Americas, facilitated by the availability of cheap gas, and we'll talk more about this later, uh, which helped gas to, to which helped to, to replace gas in Europe. So coal was released from the Americas, came to Europe, and that allowed gas to be uh, diverted to Asia. We'll trace these developments in more detail as we go fuel by fuel. Starting with oil. Uh, oil markets experienced uh, a lot of turbulence in 2011, and still have this year, 2012. Oil prices rose substantially. Um, the data of Brent, as I said, up 40% to $111 a barrel. Record in money in the day terms. Prices began the year at around $90 a barrel, and then rose very sharply to about $127 a barrel, following the loss of Libyan supplies. The, moderated thereafter, as we had a combination of the economy weakening, and oil demand growth weakening, OECD nations released 35 million barrels of strategic petroleum reserves, and uh, OPEC producers, with a bit of a lag, eventually started to replace those lost Libyan barrels. Earlier this year, of course, in 2012, we had a price spike around the standoff with Iran on, on nuclear. Uh, that caused some concerns about supply disruption. Those fears seem to have been calmed for now, <coughs> then they come back, but 
for now, they're, they're out of the way. Um, we're worrying more at the moment about the state of the global economy. So at the moment, the, the oil price is back down around $90, and it tends to go up and down according to people's sentiment about the global economy. Second key development in, in oil markets was the massive $16 gap that opened up between two of the key market prices, Brent and WTI, West Texas Intermediate. These are very similar great qualities of crude, and they normally track each other very closely. A big gap opened up between them, uh, and that was due to infrastructure constraints in the US. WTI, West Texas Intermediate, is in effect an inland US price. Uh, a lot of supply was coming on, available in that area, couldn't get to the coast, and not pipeline capacity, and therefore a disconnect between that price and the seaborne price, which is Brent. We'll hear more about that later. The main factor driving prices up last year, of course, was that decline in Libyan supply, 1.2 million barrels a day. That was the largest decline in the country's oil output we've seen for 20 years since the aftermath of the Soviet Union collapse. This was a significant event. Several other countries in the Middle East and North Africa also experienced losses, which are still, they're still there. But when you look at the aggregate data, you don't see those losses. Global oil production is actually up 1.1 million barrels a day. And virtually all the increase came from, from OPEC, which is a group which includes Libya. The reason, of course, is a massive increase in oil production from the other OPEC producers. They increased output 2.5 million barrels a day, eventually meeting not only the loss of Libyan crew, but also providing for the growth in, in oil consumption. Saudi Arabia alone increased production by 1.2 million barrels a day to a record level of 11.2 million barrels a day. Outside of OPEC, production was essentially flat, with growth in the US, Canada, Russia and Colombia offsetting continued declines in mature provinces such as the North Sea, the UK and Norway in particular were in decline, extended outages in a number of countries like Azerbaijan, and uh, biofuels were un unusually were flat last year, in 2011, due to uh, bad weather in Brazil, which hampered ethanol production. And notice there the increase in, in US supply, turns up on the chart. This is a, a very important part of the evolving oil supply story, this striking shift in oil, US oil production. The US had the largest increase in non-OPEC oil production for the third year running. Uh, and this is th largely thanks to a switch in drilling activity from gas, which has a low price, to liquids or oil, which has a high price. And it's the application now of techniques which have been developed for shale gas to oil, shale liquids. And that's proven extremely productive. I'm not sure if you can quite see the small print here. TXND, this block here, Texas and North Dakota, that's shale plates, that's shale liquids. Very strong growth and it's continuing this year. Now, combined with rising supply from, from Canada and Alberta, this was the surge in production, which meant there was too much oil in the inland areas of the US and created that disconnect with, with Brent. Uh, there's an important lesson behind all these developments. Canada and the US both have um, very open and competitive investment and property regimes. So competition plays out, and you see that in the switch between gas drilling and oil drilling. That happens very quickly in the short term. And the long-term counterpart is very rapid development of new technology, innovation, and deployment of that technology. And it's no accident that we see all this supply growth and deployment of new technologies happening in North America. On consumption, oil consumption growth was weak in 2011. Uh, global oil consumption was up just 0.7%, about half the 10 year average rate of growth. And that's despite trend rate of GDP growth. And for the 12th year in a row, oil share in global energy fell. Now, on the surface, oil consumption data appears to mimic what's going on with OECD and non-OECD energy demand. Uh, but for oil, we're quite confident now to say oil is in structural decline in the OECD. Non-OECD oil consumption grew by 1.2 million barrels a day. And of course, it's no surprise, China, once again, the largest contributor to that, with half a million, bar half a million barrels a day of growth, 42% of the world's net increase in oil consumption in China. Significant gains also seen in Russia, India, and Saudi Arabia. Consumption declined in North Africa, and growth was below average in the Middle East, and of course that's a reflection of the Arab Spring events. Also a re reflection of subsidy cuts in Iran, which has had an impact on oil consumption there. OECD consumption has continued its long-term decline, fell by 600,000 barrels a day, reaching its lowest level since 1995. US and Germany recorded the largest contractions. By coincidence, the warm winter weather we had in Europe, that reduced uh, demand for heating oil by about 120,000 barrels a day, roughly the same volume 
as the additional requirement for oil in Japan to help offset the loss of nuclear power. It just turned out to be roughly the same amount of oil. If you distinguish uh, consumption by type of product, uh, that further illuminates the reasons behind weak consumption growth for oil. The weakest portion of overall demand growth is light distillate, that's gasoline primarily. Gasoline is price sensitive, when prices go up at the pump, people buy less. And this contrasts with middle distillate, uh, diesel for example, that tends to be much more closely aligned with economic activity. So as economies grow, more middle distillate is required, particularly you see that in the non OECD. So during the recent years of high oil prices, uh, it's been middle distillates that have held up the demand growth in oil rather than light distillate. The consumption data confirm um, some other important developments. Demand responses to high international prices are still concentrated in OECD countries um, where, where subsidies are absent, but emerging economies are becoming more price sensitive because they're reducing the degree of subsidization. About 20% of the world's oil consumption in 2011 was in countries that subsidize final consumer prices of oil products, and that's down from 40% in 2008. And pretty much now the only countries that are subsidizing are the oil exporters themselves. Uh, and that group, which accounts for less than a quarter of global oil consumption, contributed two-thirds of the global demand growth. So it's the oil exporters who subsidize where a lot of the demand growth is, is coming. Uh, longer term price effects are becoming very visible. Um, fuel efficiency of new vehicles is improving rapidly in, in all markets, not just the US and Europe, it's happening in China, India, everywhere. And this is driven uh, in part by government standards, so things like the CAFE standards in the US, but it is also a consumer response. After several years of high prices, we are seeing a real shift in consumer preferences towards more efficient vehicles. Of course, the vehicle fleet only turns over relatively slowly. This is a long-term effect, and we'll see this effect for, for many more years now in the, uh, in the consumption data. And when we put it all together, overall supply and demand, we can start to tell a story of what happened to uh, what, how we explain prices in 2011 and 2012. As 2011 began, oil consumption was actually growing faster than production, and that reflected the legacy of OPEC production cuts that had been put in place after the uh, recession. <coughs> that gap widened significantly, of course, when we lost the, uh, the Libyan oil. Um, even with a large increase in output from Saudi Arabia, other Gulf states, overall out OPEC output didn't exceed the pre-disruption levels, and global production didn't exceed consumption until well, well into the year, almost the end of the year before production exceeding demand. So that left inventories, stocks, well below average, um, and supported crude prices throughout the second half of 2011. So far this year, into 2012, global production has exceeded global consumption by a large margin. Now, although we had those tensions around Iran and the nuclear standoff, and sp spike in the prices earlier this year, inventories have now returned close to normal levels, uh, setting the stage for a significant weakening of, that we've seen in prices in recent weeks. So prices are now back down below $100 a barrel for the first time since February 2011. Refining. The um, global refining business continues to be characterized by excess capacity and slow throughput growth. Net global capacity grew by 1.4 million barrels a day in 2011, but crude runs throughput only increased by 0.4 million barrels a day. So in effect, we added a million barrels a day that, that wasn't required in 2011. Most of that growth in capacity came from Asia and mainly China. Um, there's a split here between non-OECD and OECD. Non-OECD crude runs are uh, increasing. OECD crude runs are generally declining. The exception to that in the OECD is the US. As a result of the relatively low price of West Texas Intermediate, the US refiners had a competitive advantage. They increased their crude runs and they were exporting product. The US became a net exporter of oil products in 2011. For the first time, certainly in our data series, which goes back to 1960 and probably sometime since the Second World War. Global unused capacity for refining increased, as I said, by a million barrels a day in 2011. It's now five million barrels a day higher than it was in 2005. There's simply too much refining capacity around. However, not everyone's suffering. Uh, flexible sites with world-class operations, uh, particularly in 2011, had a good chance to show what they could do uh, as the world tried to make up for the loss of Libyan supplies. Disruption of Libyan crude meant that Europe lost around 800,000 barrels a day of very good quality, light, low sulfur, 
uh, crude oil. Other African exporters made up some of the, the loss, um, but most of the replacement came from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia in particular, with much heavier and, and more sulfurous crudes. So that meant that we needed more refining to turn into good, clean products. Fortunately, there was plenty of uh, excess refining capacity of a highly upgraded nature available in Europe. So the refining system was able to cope with that switch, a very large volume switch, uh, with relatively little trouble, and it had a very modest impact on the refining markets. That's an indication of it wasn't causing strain on the refining system. Natural gas. This has been one of the areas where we've seen some of the biggest changes in energy markets in the last few years. There's two key themes running through this. One is the growth of unconventional gas in the US, shale gas revolution, you've probably heard of. And the second theme is the growth of international trade, particularly of LNG, liquefied natural gas. <coughs> we saw those two things being played out in 2011, and they both played a part in the market response to the disruptions. I'll start with a summary of the changes at the aggregate level. Gas production globally was um, up 3.1%, slightly above trend. Uh, growth was primarily coming from the Middle East, North America, and former Soviet Union. Uh, consumption was up 2.2%, a little bit below trend, led by Asia Pacific, North America, and the Middle East. European consumption, in contrast, suffered an unprecedented, a record fall, 7.8% decline. Uh, of course, there's no global price for natural gas. We still have to look at regional prices. And those regional prices showed a very wide divergence in 2011. Annual average spot prices for LNG in Asia increased by 82%, $14 per MMBTU, uh, driven by a combination of higher oil prices, lifting contract prices, and the additional demand for LNG in Japan. They've since risen further, they're even higher this year, up about another 16%, 2012 year to date. At the other end of the spectrum, US prices fell. They slipped by 8% in 2011 to an average of $4 per MMBTU. They've since fallen another 42%, averaging about $2.30 this year, and at times they've been below $2 an MMBTU, extremely low, and a record discount to oil and a record discount to inter other international gas prices. European gas prices hover between those two extremes. They're between the US and Asian prices. UK spot prices averaging $9 per MMBTU in 2011, up 37% on the previous year. Milder weather helps keep spot prices below contract prices. Uh, throughout 2011 and so far this year. And that's despite the loss of Libyan supplies and despite uh, the diversion of energy cargoes to Asia. And so one of the main stories is the growth of international trade of gas, which is outpacing the growth of consumption and production. International trade was up 4%, LNG was up 10% in 2011. Uh, a nice little symmetry here that 32% of all the gas that's consumed is traded across international borders. 32% of traded gas is LNG. You put those two numbers together, it turns out that about 10% of all the gas that's consumed arrives at its destination in the form of an LNG cargo. Asian LNG imports were up 34%. There was a big shift in the pattern of LNG trade towards Asia. European LNG was only up 3%. Asia-bound deliveries accounted for 90% of the global LNG growth in 2011. Almost all of the growth in energy supply came from Qatar in 2011, which completed the final phase of their expansion and the mega trends that they've been bringing on. And Qatari LNG grew by 35%. Qatar overtook Norway to become the world's second largest gas exporter. The share of LNG deliveries into Asia rose to about 63% of the global total, and Europe's market share fell to 27%. So what was driving this switch in the pattern of trade? Of course, Japan's need to import more LNG uh, dominated the headlines due to the, the loss of the nuclear power. Uh, so Japan, the world's largest LNG importer, increased LNG imports by 12 billion cubic meters, up 12.5%. And they got additional supplies from a combination of some of the new Qatari supply went to Japan and also diversion of supplies that had previously been going to Europe from suppliers like um, Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea. Those cargoes got diverted to, uh, to Asia. Now, while Japan caught the headlines, uh, quietly in the background, China recorded the largest increase in gas consumption in the world, growing by 22%, up 23 billion cubic meters. China's gas market has now doubled over the past five years. It's still only the fourth largest in the world. 
Uh, China is now debating a program to double the share of gas in its energy mix from about 4% today to 8% under its new five-year plan. In 2011, the growth in Chinese consumption was supplied by a combination of domestic production growth, um, pipeline imports from Turkmenistan, a new, very important new route that's been opened up, ramped up significantly in 2011, and also energy imports. In addition, Asia saw a strong LNG demand growth from India, um, driven by domestic production problems, and from South Korea, which had strong economic growth and cold weather, which is a great combination for LNG demand. Overall, LNG demand in Asia was up 15%. Now, with Asia absorbing most of the growth in LNG supplies, there was little left for Europe. European markets also had to deal with a loss of Libyan gas supply and large production declines uh, within Europe. So the North Sea production is down uh, uh, very significantly, down 23 billion cubic metres, where we have underlying natural <coughs> decline of mature fields, exacerbated by a lot of maintenance in 2011, much of which was unplanned. Uh, the loss of Libyan and North Sea supplies was, actually, was mitigated by an increased uh, supply of imports from Russia, uh, but also, very importantly, by falling demand. So we had a collapse in demand, effectively, right across Europe, with the sole exception of Turkey. Due to a combination of weak economic growth, exceptionally mild winter compared to the previous year, and substitution by coal in power generation. Consumption fell faster than supply, which led to a significant build-up in inventories, and that was what kept spot prices below contract levels. While Asian markets were struggling to find enough supply for their rapidly increasing demand, and Europe was coping with production declines, North America was facing a very different challenge. The continued momentum and growth of unconventional gas supply in the US saw gas production increase by a record 47 billion cubic meters, and that accounted for nearly half of the growth in world gas production in 2011. And it took gas production in the US to a new all-time high, above the previous peak of 1973. Um, Ten years ago, everyone was talking about the, the US being in terminal decline in its gas production, and they would need lots of LNG imports to replace that. It's turned out very differently. 30% of US gas is now shale gas. Uh, demand couldn't keep up with this production growth, despite gas prices low enough versus coal to encourage substantial substitution in power generation. Uh, this excess supply led to a build-up in inventories and a reduction in net imports, primarily from Canada. And in this year, 2012, coming out of an, a relatively warm winter, we've seen US gas prices fall even lower, pushing the share of gas in power generation even higher, pushing the share of coal in power generation to record lows. And I just got an email from a colleague this morning, this new EIA data for April, where gas and coal are now have equal shares in power generation in the US. So a really significant shift in the, the power mix in the US. The growth of LNG trade and production of unconventional gas continue to transform the world of natural gas. In 2011, they combined to give gas markets the flexibility to accommodate the additional Japanese LNG demand without disruption to other parts of the system. Uh, to complete the picture, we have to look at coal. Coal was the fastest growing fossil fuel last year, both in production and consumption. Coal's story is one of um, production and trade patterns which are able to adjust to market conditions, and coal has been buttressing global supply security. Coal production increased by 6.1% globally, easily exceeding the 10-year average. Growth last year, as in many years, came from China. Um, you'll notice in the charts we have to truncate the scale. If we showed it at full scale, everything else apart from China would be invisible. Uh, China now produces half of the world's coal. Uh, growth didn't come from India. Uh, where there was a prolonged monsoon, which caused production growth to lag consumption growth by an even wider margin than usual. EU production grew by 2.6%. That's very unusual. The first time since 1995 that European coal consumption has increased. Only a small share of coal is, is traded, uh, but this share is growing in size uh, and in reach. In 2011, and outside of China, coal export is benefiting from import needs in Asia and Europe have been the, the largest contributors to production growth. With Indonesia there, recording the largest increase in production outside of China. The world's biggest exporter, here Australia, caused a decline due to the, due to the floods. Strong global demand was driven by non-OCD, particularly for China, up 9.7%, India up 9.2%, 
And if you put China and India together, that's 98%. That's virtually all of the growth in coal consumption. Over the last decade, OECD share coal consumption has declined from 47% to 29%. Last year, OECD coal consumption declined by 1.1%, five times the average rate. And that decline was particularly pronounced in the US, down 4.6%, 24 million tonnes of water equivalent, where shale gas eroded coal's role in power generation. So this is the, the coal side of that gas story. Also declined in Japan, where coal-fired power capacity was offline for a number of months following the earthquake. These declines were partially offset by growth in the EU, where coal was winning against gas, um, partly because of lower prices, but also because of some um, government interventions and regulatory incentives. Carbon prices were very weak, and of course, weak carbon prices is a, is a benefit for coal in power generation. And there were explicit quotas protecting coal in Spain. Steam coal prices in Asia remained at a premium. Chinese import demand driving up prices throughout the region, even in Japan, where, even where demand was falling. European import prices rose even more rapidly, up 31%, albeit from a lower level, and enough to attract additional volumes from across the Atlantic. Now, with Australia and South Africa's coal exports falling, there was lots of room for other suppliers to fill the gap. Indonesia benefited the most, uh, with, with uh, exports up to, to Asia up by 18%. Russia second. Uh, meanwhile, Colombia and the US and Russia satisfied Europe's higher net import requirements. So a clear pattern emerges. Higher Asian coal prices redirected exports from Indian Ocean suppliers, which had previously been heading towards Europe, back into Asia. Uh, also attracting new supplies from, from Russia and Indonesia. European markets compensated by picking up abundant Colombian and US coal supplies. And of course, that US coal was available at a competitive price because it had been backed out at home by cheap gas. So that allows us to complete this puzzle of how markets coped with large-scale disruptions that dominated the headlines in 2011. Production increases, uh, demand changes, even the weather played a part. In essence, however, this is a story of fuel substitution and shifts in uh, trade flows triggered by price adjustments. Before we leave that uh, subject, let's have a look at what happened to non-fossil fuels. Nuclear, of course, is right at the heart of one of the disruptions. Uh, nuclear production globally was down 4.3%, the largest decline on record. Nuclear output is down to levels of 2001. Nuclear share of global energy at 4.9%, the lowest share since 1986. So that was a big impact. But beyond the closure of Japanese and German nuclear reactors, the short-term impact of Fukushima was actually relatively limited. So outside of those areas, 22 countries grew their nuclear production in 2011, and one country joined the ranks of nuclear power producers in 2011, Iran. Hydroelectricity depends, of course, largely on patterns of rainfall. Uh, at the global level, it was relatively modest, modest growth, 1.6%, but there were big regional variations. So the US saw its largest ever increase in hydro output in volume terms, and the EU saw its largest ever decline in hydro output and volume terms. And those had significant impacts on those regional power balances. <coughs> Other renewable power, so this is solar, wind, geothermal, etc. Uh, power generation grew by 18%. That's the ninth successive year of double digit growth, very rapid growth now. It's the largest ever volume increment. If you turn that electricity growth into energy terms, it's 29 million tons of oil equivalent. That's 10% of the growth of world energy consumption in 2011. So renewables are still small in total share, but they are showing up now in the, in the growth of energy. And it's a larger contribution to energy growth than oil, for example. The US, China, and Germany together accounted for more than half of the, the renewable power growth in 2011. Overall, renewable energy, if you add in biofuels, accounts for 2.1% of primary energy consumption now. Uh, renewable energy didn't play a role in responding to the disruptions of 2011. Um, the expansion of renewable power is driven by installation of new capacity, which in turn is driven by policy. Uh, in time, renewables may be part of a longer term response, particularly if the outlook for nuclear becomes less certain. But in 2011, the path of, of renewables growth was largely predetermined by the existing policy settings and the capacity that had been added through to the end of 2010. Now, I described earlier 2011 as a year when the economy wasn't driving prices. But prices went up anyway, and this introduced a new 
not a new, uh, a very familiar debate, the impact of high energy prices on the economy, particularly of high oil prices. Um, there is a widespread consensus that high oil prices are detrimental to the world economy, but there's no agreement on how high the price has to be or what the magnitude of that impact is. If you're interested, there's a rich academic literature, you can delve into this complex topic. We're not going to do that this morning. I just want to pick out one element of the equation. Uh, and that's looking at the way that petrodollars can be recycled. The oil revenues earned by oil exporters, they can spend it, they can save it. To the extent they spend it, oil importers have the opportunity to get some of it back by exporting other goods and services to the oil producers. The ability of oil importing countries to do that varies a lot between countries. Europe has been very good at it. So for example, the EU in 2011 was able to claw back a lot of the, the revenue that had gone to oil producers by exporting BMWs, Mercedes, whatever, to the oil producers. Do, and they're much more effective at that than the US. Likewise, China is more effective than, than India in, in pouring back some of the, uh, the oil import money. Um, that ranking hasn't changed very much. Uh, what has changed is the relative position of the US, not because they've got better at exporting to oil producers, because they're, but because they're importing less oil. As a result of their rising production and declining demand, their net oil imports, there's that green line over on the, on, on the right there, their net oil imports are declining rapidly. And that's giving them an advantage in dealing with, with high oil prices. Now, for most of the presentation, I've got focus on 2011. Let's stand back and have a look at some long-term trends, put 2011 into a long-term context. Um, Fuel substitution is an important part of the short-term story. The long-term counterpart of that is the evolving shares of fuels in the energy mix. Oil has been in long-term structural decline for getting on for 40 years now. Its share of energy, 33% now the lowest in our, in our data set. Um, and that line really shows you how, how specialized a, a fuel can be, can become in transport, in the case of oil, if it's expensive. Um, gas share has been increasing relatively modestly in recent years. The big increase in share has been coal, rapid increase in the share of coal in, in energy. And this has profound implications, particularly for something we haven't talked about yet, carbon emissions. Carbon emissions were up globally last year by 3%, so faster than the growth of energy. And that's been the case over the past 10 years, that carbon emissions have grown faster than energy. The carbon intensity of energy consumption has been increasing. Carbon emissions fell, however, in one large energy consumer that's not known for its carbon policies, and that's the United States. The reason, of course, is the substitution of coal by natural gas. An example linking back to the uh, uh, development of new technologies and, the, and, what, and what that can do for you. Today's energy mix, of course, is still dominated by fossil fuels, with renewable energy accounting for just around 2% of global consumption. Even at current rapid growth rates and with continued financial support, uh, you can see it's going to take a long time for renewables to, to make a big difference at the global scale. And, and I guess that's kind of without technological breakthrough. And it brings to mind the question, well, we've seen technological change, rapid growth new technology with fossil fuels. Are there any lessons we can learn from that to apply to renewables? Second issue, uh, in conclusion, is the look at the, sh the short-term capacity of the system to respond in 2011, the availability of production. The longer term counterpart of that is the availability of resources. Now we've been tracking uh, proved reserves of oil and gas since 1980. And every year since 1980, gas reserves have increased. Every year except one, oil reserves have increased, despite increasing consumption. Today's proved reserves of oil are sufficient to meet current production for 54 years, for natural gas 64 years, for coal it's more than 100 years. Now, as we've long argued, the world does face a lot of challenges in growing the supply to meet the world's growing energy demand needs, but the availability of hydrocarbon resources isn't one of them. The way we rephrase it is the problems are not below ground, they're, they're above ground. Where does this leave us? Let's try and wrap it up with a few takeaway uh, comments. Um, it was a year of disruption with seemingly normal growth and in line with long-term structural trends. Uh, and these really revolve around it really revolves around the flexibility of markets. So the ability to, to increase production, to substitute across fuels, to change trading patterns, all of that has been crucial to the ease with which the system has, has adapted. For this to work, of course, prices 
must be allowed to play their role as signals to the reallocation of energy flows. And our message, one of our messages that changes very slowly, is that uh, it's to praise the role of markets in guaranteeing energy security. So there's a second related conclusion here. It's become fashionable in some quarters to advocate energy independence as the path to energy security. I think when you look at the data objectively, you see that it's precisely the interdependence of world markets with flexible trading that gives it the real strength. That's where the resilience of the system comes from. Just imagine for a moment if Japan had been truly self-sufficient, energy independent, not integrated with world markets in 2011, then many of the adjustments that we've seen would not have been possible. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll